historical context for you. It's interesting that Israel, you know, they were, they were led out of the Exodus, out of Egypt, and they were given the promise of the promised land, right? The land of Canaan, land flowing with milk and honey. And they, they took control in some sense. When they took control of Canaan, they really didn't take control of all of it. They occupied parts of it, and Canaanites occupied other parts. And over time, the animosity between them sort of settled, and the Israelites began to blend in with the Canaanites. And as they blended in, they started going to the Canaanite pagan temples, and they started worshiping the god Baal, B-A-A-L. And they started actually practicing some of the rituals of pagan worship, one of which included what's called temple prostitution. They had an altar, and they practiced prostitution there. They practiced uh, ritual intoxication. They sacrificed the sacred raisin cakes that Hosea speaks about. All these things that God is looking upon and saying, look, I've given you this promised land, and look what you've done in return. And so God really begins to get angry because of the slap in the face that it basically is. We see this depicted today, and we're talking about God's anger and how we understand it in the book of Hosea. I'm going to read for you a couple of extra verses that are listed in your bulletin in the ninth chapter. I'm going to read verse 1, verse 7, verse 10, and then chapter 10, verse 2. Listen for the emotion of God as God feels deeply about Israel and their betrayal. Do not rejoice, O Israel. Do not be jubilant like the other nations, for you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. The days of punishment are coming. The days of reckoning are at hand. Let Israel know this. Because your sins are so many and your hostility so great, the prophet is considered a fool, the inspired man, a maniac. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your fathers, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. But when they came to Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. Their heart is deceitful, and now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Speak to us, O Lord through this story, that we might find ourselves in it, that we might find the life that you offer us through it. We pray this through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. I was having a conversation this week with somebody about our congregation and sort of the background, the, the faith background of our congregation, and they made some assumptions. Well, everyone must be like so-and-so. And I said, well, not really. We're kind of a bunch of spiritual mutts. You know, we come from all manner of background. I mean, we got Baptists and Roman Catholics and Methodists and Presbyterians and Unitarians. I mean, people are all over the map. Not everyone grew up Congregationalist. And uh, as such, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, your formative years growing up in whatever tradition you grew up in really shapes your view of God. The images you had of God. And as I was reflecting on that, I thought about, you know, for me, in the earliest days, I grew up with the image of a very angry, very wrathful God. Uh, a very angry God. God had a real problem. But as I've studied Scripture, and specifically this whole story of Hosea, I've come to realize in a deeper way that God does not have an anger problem. We have an anger problem. We really do. You may have heard the story about the guy who was, he was shipwrecked on and marooned on a deserted island in the middle of the ocean. He built a house, had a chimney so that he could send smoke signals, and he was rescued by a passing ship one day. He's on the deck, and as they're cruising away from the island, the captain is standing next to him. He says, oh, I see your house with the smoke coming up, but there are two structures next to it. What's the one next to it? And he says, oh, well, that's my church. 
That's, that's our worship. He said, oh, okay, your house, your church, but then what's the third hut? He said, oh, that's my old church. <laughs> Even on a deserted island, he got mad and left. He goes, put out. People do that in church, don't they? People just get put out and leave, but it's not just church. People get put out and leave their doctor and their dentist and their mechanic and your hairdresser. Even a spouse. <laughs> People leave their jobs, right? Because they get put out, they get angry. Things happen. Remember the story? It was a couple years ago, I guess it was, the airline attendant for JetBlue uh, was angry over something. And he got on the microphone. He said something very uh, raucous to the passengers as they pulled up to the gate. He popped open a beer, drank it, then threw open the emergency door and slid down the emergency slide as a protest to jet blue, anger. And do I really need to say much about road rage? Here's a little bit of trivia for you. Found out what the number one city in the United States of America is for road rage. You might think it's Los Angeles, or Atlanta, or DC, or Chicago. What would you guess is the number one city in all of the United States for road rage, friends? Miami. Number one for road rage. People were surveyed, and this is alarming. They were asked about road rage, and 56% of men said that they experienced road rage on a daily basis. 44% of women on a daily basis. <laughs> we have an anger problem. That's why the desert fathers, the desert monks in the 4th century said, anger is the most dangerous of, human, of all human passions, even more dangerous than greed or lust. Anger. Think about it. Worldwide, worldwide, 1,425 people are murdered every day. Worldwide, 1.6 million people die by violence every year. 1.6 million. And in America, let's bring it a little closer to home. These are statistics that are a little bit old. They're dated 2002, but they give you some perspective. In 2002, 290 Americans experienced some, they suffered some kind of crime. 23% of those crimes were violent crimes. A quarter of the crime is violent. It's interesting, uh, Psychology Today did an experiment. They asked a question, a very curious question, um, that uh, you can sort of ask yourself. They said if, they had a, a study group uh, of men and women, and they asked, if you could secretly push a button and thereby eliminate any person with no repercussions to yourself, would you press that button? Now, I thought about asking you all for a raise of hands, and I thought that'd be too incriminating. <laughs> but it's interesting the way the study came out. 69% of men said yes. 56% of women said yes. What's even more interesting are the details behind it. Men would most often kill the U.S. president or some public figure. Women would kill bosses, ex-husbands, or ex-boyfriends and former partners of current lovers. <laughs> Woo! We have an anger problem. <laughs> when our anger fuels hate, it becomes lethal. Dr. Robert Sternberg says there are three components, three components that make hate. And these are very interesting to me. The first one he says is regular avoidance of interacting with people we don't like. That should get our attention, especially when we live in an insulated community. Regular avoidance of interacting with people we don't like. It's healthy to engage with people who are very different from us who we may not get along with as easily. The second component to hate is passionate contempt or disgust for an enemy. Isn't that a good question to ask? Is there anyone we have an obsessive hate, a disgust for? It's a component that is very dangerous. And then the third one really caught my attention. Here it is. Belief systems that fuel avoiding, denouncing, or degrading others. Now, we can think of that obviously as religious belief systems that encourage denouncing or degrading others, but also other ideological systems. We can think historically about the Nazis and the Jews. We can think today about the Russians and the Ukrainians. There are all kinds of, of 
ideological systems and belief systems that, uh, that do that. And it's a very, very dangerous thing. So, thinking about all of those statistics and that perspective, what in the world do we do with God's anger in Hosea? I mean, is it perhaps feeding a stereotype of a wrathful God and endorsing hatred? In a word, no. I'm going to tell you why. Four reasons why, if you're a note taker here, four reasons why I believe God's anger is not at all the stereotype that we have of being wrathful and of endorsing hatred. The first reason is because God's anger is so different from ours. So very different from ours. God's anger... Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9, says... My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. God's anger, in the big picture, and we can't always see the big picture, God's anger is always, always life-giving. Ours is not. God's anger is always a perfect response to injustice. Ours is not. God's ways are not our ways. God's anger is different from ours. The second reason I say no is that God's anger is never hatred. God's anger does not hate. It's an expression of God's love. 1 John chapter 4 uh, says, God is love. And those who love abide in God, and God abides in them. Judd Willett writes, God is love at all times. He never ceases to be love. Listen to this. His anger is an expression of his love and holiness when confronted with sin, with betrayal, and with disobedience. God is always love. The third reason is that God's anger, God's anger speaks truth. God doesn't whitewash truth. God's, God doesn't whitewash reality. Evil is oppressive. Injustice is is wrong, and God does not make any excuses for it. Paul talks about it in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, he says, in verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, we, we often close our eyes to that reality. We, you know, we think, you know, we don't acknowledge the real oppressive power of evil that's beyond our recognition. But God doesn't close his eyes to that. My wife showed me a picture of uh, some people who were caught on camera in a haunted house. I don't know if this was Google or email or, or what it was, but different people who were caught at the moment of being scared in the dark. And there was a flash picture taken. And it was the funniest thing to see all these pictures of these big, burly men going, oh, and hiding behind their wives and eyes closed. And that's the image of what, what we do with the reality of evil and darkness in this world. God doesn't close his eyes. He speaks truth. And then finally, God's anger seeks to replace right for wrong and love for hate. Our anger is often retributive. We want to get back to feel better. God doesn't act that way. God does not rage and seek retribution. We have this image, don't we, sometimes of holiness as being this kind of tranquil passivity. But far from that. It's about applying anger where it belongs. Remember Jesus in the temple? He was in the temple and he raised holy heck. He turned over the tables. He threw things around. He did the kinds of things that would get someone arrested and thrown in jail. Why did he do it? Because the poor were being taken advantage of as they had to buy these sacrifice, this animals for sacrifice in the temple. And those who were selling them were hiking the prices. And it was an injustice they were taken advantage of. And he was angry. Holiness aims anger at evil and injustice, at the right things. God's anger is, is not capricious. It's not just anything goes. It's full of care, or as I put it with the sermon title, it's careful anger. We have a lot that we can learn from God's anger. I love, some of you have seen in our uh, 
newsletter, I've been including my favorite cartoon strip from what's called Coffee with Jesus. There are these little conversations between, between Jesus and various characters in this strip. This particular one, her name is Anne. And in the Coffee with Jesus encounter, she's sitting down and they're having coffee. And she says to Jesus, remember that woman at work? The one I can't stand? We went to lunch yesterday. Funny, we actually have a lot in common. And Jesus replies, funny, yes. And I liked how you didn't react visibly to her less than refined table manners. I know that bugs you, Anne. Oh my God, she says to him, appropriately enough. That took everything in me. It was making me crazy. He said, keep this up, Anne, and you're going to be able to see past all kinds of things that don't matter. Isn't that true? We, our anger is often aimed at things that don't matter. Trivial stuff, especially in the light of eternity. We're not aimed at the things God is aimed at. And so, I've begun to appreciate more and more this little quote from Kathleen Norris. If you've not read any Kathleen Norris, she's a great author. She said, Now that I appreciate God's anger more, I find that I trust my own much less. I'm beginning to realize that how true that is. So, having said all that, let's unpack a little bit how and why God is angry in the book of Hosea. I want to point out a verse that I didn't read to you. It's in the second chapter, verse 13. The earliest, some of the earliest moments in the book of God expressing real jealous kind of anger about what Israel is doing and giving themselves away. And listen to the, listen to the way it's framed in the 13th verse. I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the Baals, God. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but she forgot me, says the Lord. Isn't that interesting imagery? If we step back and think about why Israel was created for God and why we were created, it's exactly that, for God. Our number one reason for being created in the first place is for relationship with God. And here, God feels betrayed. Israel has put on her bling and stuck out her leg on the street corner. But she forgot me, says God. And he's hurt. He's jealous. He's angry over that. Hosea and Gomer, their relationship, embody what God is experiencing with Israel. So betraying God is a violation of our ultimate purpose for existing. It's the ultimate insult, isn't it? Of replacing God. That's what idolatry is. Replacing God. It doesn't have to be processed. It can be anything that replaces God. And so as we read in verse 10 in chapter 9, it reads, and it goes back and forth like this in the book of Hosea. God gets angry, then he comes back and he thinks about all the wonderful days and how he fell in love with Israel. Then he gets angry again. It, it reads a lot like uh, you know, junior high love letters going back and forth. I dated myself by saying junior high instead of middle high. Listen to this. And this is an example right here. When I found Israel in the beginning, it was like finding grapes in the desert. What would that be like to be finding grapes in the desert? Oh, you're, you're dying of thirst and hunger. And these are, oh, what a gift. How beautiful they are. How luscious they are, right? When I saw your fathers, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. I mean, this is a love letter. But then things changed. But when they came to Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. Oh boy. A big transition happening at that moment. Instead of reflecting God's image, God's love, they went away to something else and started looking more like that thing, that idol, that shameful, vile thing, he says. And that's what we do. We trade our God-given identity for a false identity. We don't even know we're doing it a lot of times. There's a, a letter that a woman wrote to a pastor it's a very, very sobering letter to hear. Listen, I'm just going to read it straight up to you. She wrote, I have a secret life as a prostitute. It's a life I left behind many years ago when I first gave my life to Christ and got married. 
Now, 20 years later, that old lifestyle called me back. As I sank deeper and deeper into the sexual underground, I began to lose myself again. On the outside, I appear normal. I work in an office and I'm raising children. How could I let myself go like this after I had changed my life around before? It's not really about the money. I make enough money on my job to live okay. It fills this hole inside of me, an empty place that can only be filled with being wanted and desired. I've quit now for a few weeks and cut contact with the people in the lifestyle. But I ask for your prayers for strength, and I pray that God will please put some people in my path that will help lead me back to a lifestyle that I can be proud of. She says, I began to lose, lose myself again. We, we prostitute ourselves to a thousand things in our lifetime. All kinds of things replace God, take us away. And we, very subtly, begin to lose ourselves. Listen to this statement, friends. God's anger is partly how God rescues you. It's part of the way God rescues you. Chapter 10, verse 2. Their heart is deceitful, and now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. God did Israel a favor with his anger by demolishing those things, destroying their idols, by spoiling the pleasure of their prostitution. And God does the same thing for us. You know what I'm talking about. We spend our whole lives, don't we, pursuing pleasure and success? Don't we? We stick our leg out for their payoff. And what do we get? Today in America, 86% of Americans are chronically stressed out. 86%. We consume 30 tons of aspirin, tranquilizers, and sleeping pills every day in America. The annual cost to employers for stress-related health care and missed work annually every year in America is $300 billion. That's with a B. You see, we want to live on easy street. Isn't that why people move to South Florida? But the truth is, more often than not, we live at the corner of work and worry. Why does God let this happen to us? Well, God destroys our idols by simply letting us get to the end of our rope until we can't hang on anymore. And he's all we have to grasp onto. You've perhaps heard that story about the guy who was hiking and he fell over the cliff. He was just hanging on the ledge by a branch, just barely hanging. He wasn't a believer. He didn't believe in God, but he thought, well, why not give it a try in this situation? God, if you're there, are you there? Will you help me? He said, I'm here. He said, okay, well, will you please help me out here? He said, sure. Just let go of the branch. To which the guy said, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> God's anger, you know, it's, it's usually about letting our bad decisions run their natural course. Sin has natural consequences. God doesn't really have to do anything to us. But then God is, like with the story of the prodigal son, always waiting to welcome us home to his grace, to welcome us home to his mercy. You see, God's anger is full of care. It's careful anger. God's anger is an expression of his yearning for relationship with us, with you. Remember, apathy and indifference are worse than anger. We don't have a God who is indifferent toward you, who is apathetic. We have a God who is angry, which means he cares for you like you are his own child because you are his own child. He even uses that image the writer of Hebrews does. And, and parents, you know, you know how it is with your children. I mean, you correct them and discipline them because you care for them. You love them deeply. And that's the image that the writer of Hebrews uses in chapter 12 that says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons and daughters for what son or daughter is not disciplined by his father? You see, your true identity is... Your true identity is as a son or daughter of the Most High God. 
Your true identity is as one who has been redeemed to follow Christ. As one who has been filled with the reality of God's Spirit living in you right now. You are a child of the King of Kings. You are the bride of Christ. That's the image that Scripture uses for you. You are the bride of Christ. Bob George uses, uses a wonderful story to help us get in touch with that in his book, Classic Christianity. He says this. He says, let's imagine that a king made a decree in his land that there would be a blanket pardon extended to all prostitutes. Would that be good news to you if you were a prostitute? Of course it would. No longer would you have to live in hiding, fearing the sheriff. No longer would you have to have a criminal record. All past offenses are wiped off the books, so the pardon would definitely be good news. But would it be any motivation at all for you to change your lifestyle? No. Which is why we see in the book of Hosea, he, he forgives his wife, Gomer, again and again, but she continues to go out. But Bob George continues the story. He says, let's say now that not only is a blanket pardon extended to all who have practiced prostitution, but the king has asked you in particular to become his bride. What happens when a prostitute marries a king? She becomes the queen. Now, would you have a reason to change your lifestyle? Absolutely you would. You are the bride of Christ. Jesus died for that relationship to be the reality that defines your life. And friends, God will always be hot with holy anger toward anything and anyone who stands in the way of that reality. Thanks be to him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this story that continues to show us the depths of your love, your passion for us, for you, how you obsessively pursue us. Like Hosea did Gomer, like you did Israel, so do you with us. We thank you for, for finding us and for calling us home. We thank you for the faith that we inherit, that we might celebrate the love you have for us and with us. Increase your love in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Steadfast in our love, not judging, slow to anger, merciful and forgiving, and shows us that we are yet your children, needing your love your correction, your forgiveness, your generosity, your mercy, your protection, and your holiness. We are so blessed to be made in your image, and that even as creatures, you, our Creator, God of all, choose to love us as your family. As the reality of this sinks in, words to describe the awe in us you inspire don't seem to be adequate. Thank you, dear Father, and please help us to keep our hearts open to receive your love. We ask that you hear our intercession for others this morning. We pray for Norman Lay. We keep praying for, he, for his recovery this morning. We pray for George Werner. We want to thank God for helping George through, through two uh, stays at the hospital. He's home, and, and we pray for his continued recovery. We continue to pray for Chuck Freer, for Loretta Scheller, for Barbara McClurkin, who's recovering from hip surgery, and for Diane McDonald, recovering from op an operation. Lord, protect our missionary team in Haiti, Barbara and Ken, as well as our youth team led by Mark and Paul, who have gone to serve. We pray for those they are sent to minister to. And Lord, we ask your presence for those who mourn the loss of a loved one, those who are lonely, those who have financial needs, and even those whose needs, Lord, that we do not name, but Holy Spirit, you know those needs also. Thank you, Lord, for your intervention. We pray for those whose lives are in danger in Iraq and other places in the world. Bless our fathers throughout our land today, and thank you for being our Father 
And now hear our prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.